Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses as we continue with part 13, False Cults and Societies, from A History of Secret Societies by Archon Daral. Chapter 12, False Cults and Societies. The student of secret organizations does not go short of information about completely spurious cults and those about whose real existence there is a reasonable doubt. It is often thought, and perhaps more often stated in the press, that the world is riddled with sinister cults practicing black magic, garbage addiction, or pure deception. It is said, of course, by those who believe that the whole basis of ritualistic organizations is delusion, that they are all false anyway. But a number of distinctions can be made. Not all cults which are dominated by adventurers were always bogus, and some which started off in a dubious manner have achieved respectability. We hear of this problem mostly in its Western expression, false yogis everywhere, bizarre idol worship in California, Satanism in France, but its roots go back even farther than we can trace them. Take the case of the traditional Eastern story of the Turkish saint, which is folklore, but maybe part truth. Centuries ago in Anatolia, a sage lived with his small son in a hut beside a zirat, a shrine where a holy man was buried. Over the years, the place had acquired such sanctity that pilgrims came from as far as Africa and the Indies to say a prayer and invoke the sanctity of the unknown saint. The boy, on the threshold of manhood, decided that he would travel in search of knowledge, go to seek his fortune as the Prophet Muhammad had once said, yea, even unto China journey for knowledge is the most excellent of all things. His father gave him a donkey to ride upon, and the youth set off. He passed through the famed cities of Islamic learning through Isfahan, Bokhara, Samarkand, sitting at the feet of teachers, and then turned his steps towards China. It was in Kashmir several years later that the donkey suddenly lay down and died. The young man was beside himself with grief. Unable to decide what to do, he buried his only friend and sat in mourning upon the mound. Certain travelers passing by asked what ailed him. My only friend and companion is buried here, he who never failed me, who inspired me, and who was my means of progress. Deeply impressed by this, they assumed that he spoke of a spiritual teacher. They donated some money for a dome to be built over the grave of an individual who must have been of much merit if he could inspire the sorrow which they had seen. The youth, Mustafa, never looked back. More years passed and his father found that the revenues of his own shrine were suffering through the diversion of pilgrims to this new and highly sanctified one in Kashmir. He decided to travel thence in order to ascertain who this revered sheikh might be. As soon as Mustafa saw him, he broke down and confessed the truth. No, my son, said the sage, that all is ordained in advance. It was fated that there should be a shrine here and that you should become a shrine keeper. For let it not be concealed from you that the grave of the unknown sage, which is my own shrine, marks the spot where, under similar circumstances exactly, the father of that donkey of yours expired. Apart from those who have sainthood thrust upon them in the East, there have been in the past few decades quite a number of new cults, claiming ancient origins, organized for tourists and others. Egypt is a prolific source of these bodies, originally started by various unscrupulous individuals for the Westerners attracted to the pyramids, the Order of Isis is a good example. Credulous believers in the fact that all wonders came from ancient Egypt joined the various competing branches of the order in droves. It became more democratized during and just after World War II, when many young soldiers of allied armies were enrolled, sons and daughters of Isis, inducted with the strictest secrecy. The fact that the mysteries of Isis were traditionally only lesser ones was known to the initiators as little as to the initiated. Libel laws prevent one from detailing some of the cults which are still running, but it may safely be generalized that some of the yoga ones are run by adventurers. It is easier to spot a really false cult than one might think, though the knowledge of how to do so comes mostly through personal experience. The completely false cult relies upon window dressing and impressing the individual with the atmosphere and ritual of the order, or whatever it may be called. Few spurious cults depend upon the personality of the chief because it is the exception when the false magus has a sufficiently impressive presence to dispense with the trappings, at least in the early stages of initiation. Contrary to the sensationalist writers, secret cults and societies do not rely greatly upon drugs of addiction, perhaps because this is one direction in which the authorities are far too much in control of the situation. Hypnotism, too, is an uncertain tool, to say the least of it. 
as anyone with practical applied knowledge of experimental hypnosis will testify. Cults connected with sexual perversion and other aberrations do spring up now and then, and there is always the possibility that such things may obtain in a secret organization. The fact that perverted people are fickle or feel themselves in need of a change from time to time, however, militates against the long-term use of this in a secret organization. What then keeps false cults in being for any appreciable period of time? Firstly, the desire for power. Secondly, the love of mystery. Thirdly, a sense of being someone special. Fourthly, the feeling that one is going to gain something by membership. It will be seen that the pandering to such sensations is not the province of secret cults alone. Almost every advertiser is guilty of it, though seldom to an antisocial degree. Eliphas Levy has given a graphic description of a cult which was false in that it was concocted by a group of politicians but not spurious in as much as its leader and many followers believed in it. He calls them the saviors of Louis XVII. Even people who fought against them, he says, were eventually overcome by their beliefs and joined them. Certain individuals concocted a sect and chose as its leader a certain laborer named Eugene Vintras, and he explains how they did it. It was not hard, given a rather gullible dupe in the form of a Vintras. The year was 1839. Vintras was sitting in his room expecting a workman to arrive. There was a knock on the door and there he saw an old man dressed in rags. This apparition addressed Vintras as Pierre Michel, names which he thought nobody knew were his. The visitor complained that everyone thought him a thief, that he was weary and so on. Vintras touched, handed him ten sous with a reassuring word. He left, but Vintras did not hear him go downstairs. He searched the house but could not find him. He later found that there was a mysterious letter with the coin which he had given to the stranger on top of it on his table. This letter by its contents and supernatural appearance made Vintras, probably with some other inspiration of a similar kind, a protagonist of Louis XVII. Now Vintras appears as a sort of seer and prophet carrying on propaganda for Louis in a field where it could do a great deal in the twilight of supernatural belief. He had visions all showing support for Louis Blood appeared on his body without any vestige of a wound. Wine turned to blood. Even priests who came to scoff joined the cult in enthusiasm when they saw the miracles which they had preached about actually seemingly occur before their eyes. Vintras was accused of being in league with the devil. Analysts certified that the blood was indeed real. But the blood appeared on consecrated hosts and even priests could not believe, as some indeed said, that the devil had the power to cause such a change to the body of Christ. Gozzoli, one of his former supporters, published a tract in which he made revelations of obscene rites being performed by the cult. These included black masses, ritual nudity and indiscriminate physical license among the worshippers. By November 1843, when Pope Gregory issued a letter condemning the cult, it had supporters everywhere. The obscenity revelations were discounted as due to jealousy or, of course, the machinations of the evil one. Vintras was not to be outdone by a mere bishop of Rome. In his turn, he excommunicated Gregory and proclaimed himself Pope. There is no doubt that he was thoroughly persuaded that he was a messiah of some kind and that he suffered from extraordinary hallucinations. Some of his letters survive in which accounts of incredible experiences are preserved. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.